The question is, how are we at breaking point? Have we reached that breaking point in the industry and what might trigger it? Let's start with looking at what's going on on the supply side of things. And really we've got herd inventory at what we think are 35 year lows, so very limited situation. We've got slaughter numbers down, obviously. Limited, uh, limited cattle in the system mean less, less to slaughter. Down 20% year on year, down 30% on the five year average. We've got cattle on feed numbers down 8% year on year and down 3% on the five year average. And feedlot marketings, obviously less cattle on feed mean that we've got 23% down year on year in terms of feedlot cattle turning off feed and 8%, down 8% on the five year average. What was interesting though, looking at those state by state figures is we've got New South Wales marketings are up 2% year on year for quarter one this year, which is interesting, while Queensland numbers are down quite significantly, down 36%. Um, is this a factor with the improved seasons when we're starting to see more feeder cattle flow through uh, into those New South Wales feedlots or is it a case of shorter days on feed and turning more cattle off? Um, given New South Wales cattle, f cattle on feed numbers are actually up 3.3% year on year, it may be that we're starting to see those numbers flow through uh, with the rebuild underway. But what's happening on the demand side? That's the supply side of things. What's happening on the demand side? It's always good to start with, well, who's your customer? Where does your grain-fed beef go? And I would hope that this is a question that many of you are asking as you're supplying those grain-fed cattle into the feedlot system. Looking at the grand numbers or the, the macro numbers from an Australian point of view, 55% of our grain-fed beef is still consumed here in Australia. Now, this number has been gradually coming down. If we were to look back in 2001, about 70 to 80% of our grain-fed beef was consumed in Australia, and it's been gradually coming down over the course of the last 10, 20 years. Um, that means, obviously, the domestic market is having a lower impact on our, our demand for grain-fed cattle, um, and also in terms of the demand for those feeder cattle. And while there are undoubtedly a, a large number of those high quality grain fed cattle going into our premium restaurant and food service chains, um, there are still a lot of them that actually make it through onto the supermarket shelf. If you look at the macro numbers, about 80% of our fresh meat purchases are made through supermarkets. So they have a very big role to play in terms of that demand for that feed, fed animal and the demand for those feeder cattle. With 55% grain fed, we've still got 45% that go into our export markets and 85% of that actually goes to three key markets. Japan has been the mainstay of the market and we got a shot in the arm back in 2003 when US recorded a case of BSE. Um, since then, the US has gradually recovered its share in the market. And we're generally 50-50 in terms of supplying into that market. South Korea has been a growing market, and that's also because South Korean beef consumption and import demand has been growing. Again, we share that with the US. So a US is a very important market for us to keep an eye on in terms of that demand for grain-fed beef. And then China, um, the third market in that space. And since our opening up of trade and the free trade agreement back in 2015, we've seen numbers really rise quickly into that Chinese market. Um, you know, it became our second biggest grain-fed market back in 2019. Yes, numbers did come back a little bit last year, um, but it still was our second biggest year for grain-fed product going into China last year. Interestingly, we're seeing a bit of a change in that Chinese market. 61%, um, well, we actually saw a 61% increase in the um, volume of chilled grain-fed beef going into that market uh, compared to 2019. So that was the largest volume of chilled grain-fed product going into that Chinese market we've seen on record. And it's grown from about a 5% share of our grain-fed exports to that China market to now 15% last year. So and a rising importance of chilled grain-fed product going into that Chinese market. How have those markets been actually accommodating these higher livestock prices and has that been passed through? Well, looking first at the domestic market, we can see here that beef prices have seen a very strong growth in the retail sales part of retail market for Australia. Um, in quarter two, or since quarter two last year, we've seen retail beef prices actually increase by about 13.5%, far beyond all the other proteins in that meat cabinet. We've seen lamb only up 1.5%, pork is actually down, and chicken is about 1.5% higher as well. So beef by far outpacing the increases in prices of all the other proteins. Now, there is possibly a way that we're actually, the supermarkets in managing that, and we've seen that across the actual shopping basket, 
Bread and cereal prices actually declined over the same period. Dairy prices have declined over the same period and fruit and veg prices have been about two and a half percent higher. So they've probably spread some of those increased prices and lower margins across the other categories. But have we actually seen an increase or decrease in overall consumption as a result of these higher prices? Well, if you do some quick maths based on our volume of production, the volume of beef that we actually export, we have seen a reduction in the amount of beef that we're consuming domestically here, and it works out to be about a 16% reduction. So yes, higher prices are probably having a bit of an impact on domestic consumption, but I, I dare say, you know, we've been able to accommodate some of these higher prices through higher retail prices. On the export market point of view, where it's a similar sort of story, but we've really been benefited by the fact that the US has seen extremely high prices over there and we've got strong demand from China balancing that as well. So in the US, we've actually seen as a result of very strong demand in the US um, situation and also a limited ability to actually feed that demand. We've seen the US choice cutout value actually peak at about 338 US dollars a hundredweight. Uh, that works out to about $10 a kilo which was actually 64% higher than the start of the year. So that was the figure in June, um, 338 uh, US dollars per hundredweight, and it was 64% higher than where it started the year in January. Since June, however, we've seen those prices start to come off. They've dropped down to 265 per hundredweight, which is about $7.90 Australian. Um, if we were to look at the average across the board in 2019, that average price would have been about 660 Australian. So it's dropped, but it's still got a bit of a way to go before it reaches the more average prices. The other thing to look at as well is the China pig herd and what's happened with production over there. We've seen increased slaughter numbers. We've seen Chinese retail pork prices drop 51% since January. Now, thankfully, beef prices haven't seen the same drop, but that relative pricing compared to pork will mean that we see a bit of downward pressure on beef prices. So at the moment, from a grain-fed export market point of view, we've been supported by the fact that we've got strong demand from China and high prices from the US. And you can see in the graph here, you can see that US uh, imported price into Japan for brisket and short plate. Um, you can see that red dotted line really start to take off um, since the beginning of this year. But as I noted, Cutout values in China are actually uh, in the US are starting to come down now, so we might start to see relief in that pressure and increased competition for the Australian product. So, will the rope snap? Well, there are a number of things that are going to actually influence how much pressure is in this system at the moment, and a lot of it will come down to how many cattle are actually available at the point in time and when this pressure starts to exert some more influence on it. First of all, as I mentioned there, the US market and beef prices. We've seen very strong prices in the US, which has enabled us a little bit of comfort into those key markets of Japan and Korea. But with, Jap with, with US prices starting to come back down again, we're gonna find some increased pressure in those markets and obviously some questions from those buyers. Chinese demand. We've seen very strong demand in China across all proteins. As we've noted, we've started to see pork prices come down with increased pork slaughter over there. Beef prices aren't affected as much, but obviously they will continue to face downward pressure with declining pork prices over there. We've also seen US exports to China increase dramatically. They were seven times greater in Q1 this year than what they were in Q2 Q1 last year. So we're going to see increased US pressure in that market as well. So that's having a bit of a downward influence on the market at the moment as well. More locally, we're going to see this increased and ongoing pressure with cost of production pressures in the supply chain. Not only is it a, cha uh, a challenge with high cattle prices, but a very big challenge with low cattle volumes as well. As I said, 20 to 30% down in terms of the volumes going through the system at the moment. If you're trying to run an abattoir with numbers like that, it places a huge challenge on the actual use of that workforce. And the decision you've got as to whether or not you continue to pay the cattle prices you've got and keep the workforce working or start to offload that workforce and reduce shifts because you can't afford the cattle anymore. Obviously, once you start offloading loading that workforce, the challenge then becomes, can you get them back on board? So there are huge pressures in the supply chain around that as well. And then obviously we've got a seasonal challenge. Um, if the season was to turn, and at the moment the indications are that it's all looking very positive, um, but if it was to turn, potentially, well, there will be increased liquidation of cattle and downward pressure on prices. We did see back in 2017, cattle prices dropped about 80 cents in the space of about four months. That was 20, 30% drop. Um, now, at the moment, I think we've got a bit of fat in the system in that I think there's probably about a 70 or 80% gain at the moment, given your weight gains if you're a backgrounder. But still, it does say that it does show that we can see prices change in the space of four months and lose 20 to 30% off that market. 
Overall though, the key influence is gonna be how this herd rebuild process actually plays out. Whether or not people have been aggressive and we start to see a very big flow of numbers come through the system with new weaner cattle and feeder numbers coming on board over the course of the next 12 months or whether it's gonna be a more staged, staggered recovery process. And you'd have to say with large parts of Queensland still yet to see a very strong, favorable season, there's probably a fair bit of rebuilding to go yet. So we might actually continue to see some supporting demand for those prices and therefore prices remain firm. Um, but at the same time, we're not necessarily gonna see a huge volume of numbers. So a number of things that are gonna play out and balance in the market. We've gotta keep our eyes open on everything. Um, that's a bit of a summary from me. Thank you very much. Bye for now.